There is no constitutional barrier to someone who has been convicted of crimes from taking the, the presidency. Uh, in fact, there is no constitutional reason why somebody who is currently incarcerated couldn't become president, although it would be extraordinarily inconvenient. So that's one of the reasons why we've been pointing to Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, because that is the provision in the Constitution that says that Donald Trump cannot hold public office. Welcome to the award-winning podcast, Lawyer to Lawyer, with J. Craig Williams, bringing you the latest legal news and observations with the leading experts in the legal profession. You're listening to Legal Talk Network. Welcome to Lawyer to Lawyer on the Legal Talk Network. I'm Craig Williams coming to you from Southern California. I write a legal blog named May It Please the Court and have two books out titled How to Get Sued and The Sled. With primaries set to start in the spring of 2024, an upcoming presidential election, and a number of federal and state indictments against former President Donald J. Trump, including the January 6th indictment, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment has taken center stage. It reads, no person who has taken an oath as an officer of the United States can hold office if they have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the same or given aid or comfort to the enemies thereof. Well, legal scholars have taken notice. In a piece in The Atlantic, Harvard law professor Lawrence Tribe and former judge of the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit, J. Michael Luttig, discussed how the Constitution prohibits Donald Trump from ever being president again. And also featured in a New York Times article, Professors William Patrick Baud and Professor Michael Stokes Paulson, who are two members of the Conservative Federalist Society, one of them the founder, have conducted research on Section 3 and have released a paper, a law review article, with their findings in the pages of the Pennsylvania Law Review, supporting the disqualification of former President Trump from public office. So will Section 3 of the 14th Amendment actually impact the presidential election and eliminate Donald Trump from running? Today on Lawyer to Lawyer, we're going to spotlight Section 3 and what this could mean for the upcoming presidential election. And to help us better understand this issue, we're joined today by Ron Fine, the legal director of Free Speech for People. Ron litigates campaign finance, election protection, government accountability, and other constitutional democracy cases in courts across the United States. He regularly testifies before state and local governments around the country and is an author of The Constitutional Demands It, the case for the impeachment of Donald Trump, published in 2018. Welcome to the show, Ron. It's great to join you, Craig. Hey, Ron, why don't you give us a little bit of idea about your work as the legal director for Free Speech for People, what led you there, kind of the background of what it is you do? Thanks. So Free Speech for People was founded on January 26th, 2010, which is the date of the U.S. Supreme Court's decision in Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission, which, as you know, unleashed uh, corporate political spending in elections by holding that corporations have the same rights as people to spend money on political uh, elections in the United States. And that really transformed the landscape of campaign finance and the influence of money in politics in this country. I had previously been at the United States Environmental Protection Agency, and even before Citizens United, I had seen how uh, environmental policymaking was time and again, not just at the federal level, but also at the the state and sometimes local level, stymied by the influence of, of big money in politics. And so that's why I joined Free Speech for People. And we focused uh, on campaign finance reform, and we continue to do so since 2010. Since Trump came into office, of course, that presented a a new and additional and in some ways more urgent threat to our constitutional democracy. And that's why when he refused to divest himself of his businesses, which put him in violation of the foreign and domestic emoluments clauses of the U.S. Constitution, we launched an impeachment campaign on the day of his inauguration in 2017. And more recently, uh, after January 6th, 2021, as we'll discuss, we filed the first challenges under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment in uh, 150 years uh, back in 
January of 2022 and brought the first trial under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment since uh, Reconstruction. And that's what brings us here today. Right. Well, there has been, uh, I think, a trial in the meantime. Wasn't there a uh, senator that got uh, bounced and then overturned in the Supreme Court to be able to get back into the con- to Congress? I'm not sure if that's exactly how it played out. There was a case involving a a member of the uh, House called Victor Berger uh, in 1919. And and that's why when I say we filed the first lawsuit uh, to disqualify a a candidate uh, in 150 years, Victor Berger was a case where the House used its power to be the judge of the qualifications of its members to uh, exclude him. Uh, And most people agree that 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 wasn't the the best use of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment at this point. Uh, And then uh, ultimately, he was later admitted. Right, for three terms, I believe. The important thing about the Victor Berger case is that in that process, Victor Berger argued unsuccessfully to the U.S. House that Section 3 of the 14th Amendment only applied to the Civil War and had no lasting uh, implications. And the House quite rightly uh, rejected that and said that it was written prospectively in language to apply for all time. Right. And it seems that Congress has a separate right to be able to enforce the 14th Amendment, the uh, Section 3, apart from either uh, the state electors and also apart from the state, from uh, federal and state courts. In fact, there's a, a decision, I think, in New Mexico preventing a uh, New Mexican congressman, I believe, or a senator, state senator from taking office because of his participation in the election. Actually, a conviction. Is that correct? Uh, it, it's slightly different, but that, that's the general thrust of it. Um, that was a case that was launched by a, a different organization uh, called Crew against a, a county commissioner in New Mexico named Quee Griffin uh, for his involvement in the January 6th insurrection. And it, it wasn't a, a challenge to him as a candidate. He was already in office. It was using a, a different legal procedure called a quo waranto, which is a, a sort of ancient Latin procedure that, that still exists in, in most states as a means to challenge a, a state or local official's ability to hold office. Uh, and they, uh, they succeeded in that case, and he was removed from office. Right. And there seems to be little question that the 14th Amendment, the third section, was enacted in uh, 1868 in order to prevent the Reconstructionists or the uh, Southerners from actually coming back in. I think the, some of the Civil War people that were sent to Congress, including a vice president of the Confederacy, along with generals and so forth, what was the idea behind the, or the original enactment of, the, of this section? Right after the Civil War ended, several leading ex-Confederates showed up to Congress uh, and said, hey, I've just been elected uh, and, and presented their credentials as if nothing had happened, as if they hadn't been disloyal uh, and hadn't launched a, a bloody war that you know, led to hundreds of thousands of deaths. And uh, Congress, uh, the Republican Party, was, was quite rightly outraged. And that included, as you said, a former vice president of the Confederacy, uh, Alexander Stevens, several ex-Confederate generals and uh, members of the uh, Confederate Congress. And so uh, the Republican Congress, uh, the United States Congress, I should say, uh, the Union um, at that time, uh, refused to seat them uh, on the grounds of disloyalty. And they began a process that's known as Reconstruction, where they realized that the leadership of the Confederacy uh, was too dangerous to allow to remain in power because if they stayed in power, then they would just go on as if nothing had happened and and resume their old ways. So the idea of Reconstruction was to some extent radical. It was to remake that society. Uh, But a key part of that was to say that the leadership of the slave power could not come back into power into power. And as part of that, they enacted the 14th Amendment. Uh, Most people are more familiar with uh, Section 1 of the 14th Amendment, which includes the due process clause, which uh, requires states to guarantee due process of law, and the equal protection clause, which requires states to treat people equally. But Section 3 was actually more important to Congress at the time uh, because they saw it as essential to 
preventing another uh, rebellion. And it says that anyone who uh, should have known better, who, who held uh, a position that required them to support an oath to the Constitution and then engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the United States, couldn't be trusted to hold public office unless and until two-thirds of both houses of Congress would vote to grant them amnesty. And so while this provision was in, in its greatest effect, uh, which was for until about 1872, there were uh, tens of thousands of ex-Confederates who were kept out of the halls of power. And that's really when uh, the South was able to, to begin to build a more inclusive democracy. Unfortunately, at some point, uh, the North uh, got basically tired uh, of, of Reconstruction and, and ended it prematurely and granted a widespread amnesty that allowed uh, most of those ex-Confederates uh, to return to power. Uh, and that's why we saw the rise of, of Jim Crow and so forth. Uh, but, but during the time when it was actually implemented, it was effective at preventing the return to power of those who had led the rebellion against the United States. And how is January 6th any different? Well, in many ways, January 6th isn't that different. Uh, so obviously the, the, the number of you know, deaths uh, of January 6th is smaller than the Civil War, and, and we can put that aside uh, because one thing that we do know is that although obviously the Civil War was front of mind when Congress was enacting Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, the sponsors repeatedly said uh, that this applies to all insurrections. There, there had been insurrections against the United States before uh, the Civil War. Um, you, know, you may have learned in American history about uh, the Shays Rebellion, also called Shays Insurrection or, or the Whiskey Insurrection. And these were actually about the same size as January 6th. They were uh, loosely organized. They weren't, um, you know, uh, people marching in formation in uniforms. They had comparable numbers of fatalities to January 6th. But what's most important about January 6th, unlike the Whiskey Insurrection, unlike Shay's insurrection, and arguably unlike the Civil War, is that January 6th was a violent attack on the U.S. Capitol, which is certainly farther than the Confederacy ever got, uh, with the intent of stopping the peaceful transfer of power, which it succeeded at doing, if only temporarily, uh, and, and came close to assassinating the Vice President of the United States. And under any definition of insurrection that the people who enacted the 14th Amendment would have used, January 6th qualifies as an insurrection. Ron, we're going to take a quick break to hear from our word from our sponsors. We'll be right back. You like legal podcasts because you're curious and want to be the best attorney you can be. I'm Dave Scriven Young, host of Litigation Radio, produced by ABA's litigation section with Legal Talk Network. Search in your favorite podcast player for Litigation Radio to join me and my guests as we examine hot topics in litigation and topics that will help you to develop your litigation skills and build your practice. I hope you'll check out Litigation Radio and join the ABA litigation section for access to all of the resources, relationships, and referrals you need to thrive as a litigator. Hey, Guy, what's up? Just having some lunch, Conrad. Hey, Guy, do you see that billboard out there? Oh, you mean that guy out there in the gray suit? Yeah, the gray suit guy. Order up. There's uh, all those beautiful, rich, leather-bound books in the background. That is exactly the one. That's J.D. McGuffin at Law. He'll fight for you! I bet you he has got so many years of experience. Like decades and decades. And I bet, Guy, I bet he even went to a law school. Are you a lawyer? Do you suffer from dull marketing and a lack of positioning in a crowded legal marketplace? Sit down with Guy and Conrad for Lunch Hour Legal Marketing on the Legal Talk Network, available wherever podcasts are found. And welcome back to Lawyer to Lawyer. I'm joined by Ron Fine. He is the legal director for the Free Speech for People. We've been talking about the third section of the 14th Amendment. Ron, you have a campaign going on called 14.3. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, there, there are two ways that we are seeking to enforce Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. And I should say that uh, there are many ways that it can be enforced, but these are the, the two tracks that we are pursuing. First, 
we are calling on secretaries of state, or depending on the, the particular state, it might not be the secretary of state, but some other uh, elections board or other chief uh, elections official, uh, to exercise the powers that they have under state law to exclude ineligible candidates from the ballot to apply that to Donald Trump. This actually happens all the time. It's usually not as high profile, but uh, there are many cases where uh, someone who's you know not old enough to run for president or who's not a natural born citizen, nonetheless, you know, files paperwork to run for uh, president. And these state officials rule that, no, you're not eligible. You can't appear on the ballot. Interestingly enough, none other than uh, Supreme Court Justice Neil Gorsuch, back when he was a, a court of appeals judge, upheld this practice and said, this is something that state secretaries of state or other chief election officials absolutely can do. So back in 2021, we sent letters to the chief election officials of all 50 states plus the District of Columbia, laying out the case for why Trump was disqualified under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. Uh, Since then, uh, we've renewed that call with more focused outreach towards uh, particular secretaries and chief election officials, but really it's it's the mandate of the Constitution that applies to all of them because these election officials have themselves taken an oath to support the Constitution. And even if they didn't realize it at the time, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment has been a part of the Constitution for all this time. That's the first track. The second track is that uh, most states provide a procedure by which uh, voters can file a formal legal challenge to a candidate's eligibility for office. The structure of that type of challenge, the timetable is different in every state, but uh, most states provide some legal challenge opportunity like that. And in multiple states, uh, we are representing voters who will be challenging Trump's eligibility to appear on the ballot. Well, let's talk about this self-executing aspect of this. You know, it's pretty easy to determine whether a person is 35 years old and, and is eligible to run as president. That is an objective determination. Seemingly as easy to determine that there's been an insurrection, but it's still subjective. How is it that that these state election officials are going to make this determination? And who gets to challenge it? And in what forum if the decision doesn't go the way that you're asking it to go? Well, first of all, I, I wouldn't say it's subjective. I would say that it, it might be harder than determining age, but just because something is hard doesn't mean that the Constitution doesn't require it. There's a, a question of fact and applying fact to law, but the legal terms involved, insurrection, what does it mean to engage, those all have definitions. And so someone who has the authority to make this determination has to apply the law to the facts. That's what courts do. That's what uh, you know, government officials do every day, in some cases with uh, legal questions that are much harder than this one. Uh, So the way this would play out, uh, to separate those two tracks I spoke of earlier, is if, let's say, a secretary of state is in the particular state is the one who makes this determination, uh, we have actually provided them with a model declaration that they could use that lays out the facts and the law uh, and provides why Trump is disqualified. If they issue that, a declaration and you know, announce that they're refusing to include Trump on the ballot. In, in some states, there's a, a path for in state law specifically for the excluded candidate to challenge the secretary's decision. But certainly in any case, Trump could go to federal court as those candidates uh, I mentioned before, like in the case involving Neil Gorsuch, uh, as the as the judge, um, not as a candidate, uh, and and he could challenge that decision, and he has every right to have his day in court to challenge that type of decision. On the other hand, if we're talking about the second track, where it's a a formal legal challenge that we filed, those are set up differently in every state. In some states, that type of challenge occurs directly in court. Uh, in some states, that's before a, a state board of elections which holds a hearing, uh, which could then be appealed to court, uh, and and so on. So in every instance, there will be an opportunity uh, for a neutral judicial decision maker to either be the first one to answer the question or to review it on appeal. But the key point is, this is maybe more factually complex, uh, certainly more high profile than previous cases, but it fits into the general pattern of 
candidate eligibility challenges and determinations by the state entities that are empowered to make those decisions. Now, there are some conservatives who would certainly whitewash your efforts and say this is just a liberal plot to take over the world, but you've got two pretty conservative professors on your side. That's right. Uh, so recently, uh, professors uh, William Baud and Michael Stokes Paulson, who are both uh, extremely conservative, uh, involved with the Federalist Society, and, and I would say really sterling conservative credentials, uh, issued a, a groundbreaking law review article. It's a, a good read, uh, even for non-lawyers, uh, and it sets out the case from uh, an originalist perspective, which I, I think in this case is, is certainly appropriate, that Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, it may look like it has big implications, and that's exactly because it was written and intended to have big implications. And so that helps demonstrate that this is not a partisan issue. Uh, application of the Constitution should, should never be a partisan issue. This is a neutral constitutional principle. Section 3 of the 14th Amendment is just as much a part of the Constitution as anything else. And uh, applying the Constitution should never be seen as uh, a partisan or inappropriate action because the Constitution is what binds us as a country. So if you proceed along these lines and you lose uh, and Trump gets elected to office, does Congress then have the power to impeach under Section 3? Congress certainly could. Uh, arguably, they, they already did. And of course, a, a majority, uh, I believe 57 uh, in the Senate, uh, voted to convict, although that conviction requires uh, a two-thirds majority in the Senate. What was interesting uh, is that of the senators who voted uh, essentially not guilty in Trump's impeachment proceeding, uh, many of them said, uh, that it was a jurisdictional decision, that they uh, felt they couldn't vote guilty in an impeachment trial because he wasn't in office at the time. And, and that might not apply in a, a second impeachment while he's in office. But I think everyone would agree that the best time to resolve this uh, is now, before primaries and before the general election and, and certainly before the inauguration of uh, whoever the next president is. And so that's why we will be prepared to file challenges in the near future to Trump's eligibility, again, in, in multiple states using these candidate eligibility challenge processes. Ron, it's time for us to take another quick break to hear a word from our sponsors. We'll be right back. And welcome back to Lawyer to Lawyer. I'm back with Ron Fine. We've been talking about the 14th Amendment, Section 3. But Ron, your organization, I believe, has already mounted two challenges, one to Representative Matthew Cawthorn and another one to Marjorie Greene. The one that Cawthorn became moot because he lost the election. But what happened with Marjorie Greene? Well, what's interesting about both of those challenges is that we actually set important legal precedent that uh, helps us in these cases against Trump. You know, for non-lawyers, they, they might look and say precedent, but you didn't manage to get either one of them disqualified. But, but lawyers certainly understand that uh, the actual nature of a judicial decision or a series of decisions can set good legal groundwork. So in the Madison Cawthorn case, uh, what happened was that he argued, uh, so we filed a challenge before the North Carolina State Board of Elections that Cawthorn was disqualified, and, and that's how you do it in North Carolina. And he went to federal court and sought and obtained an injunction against the North Carolina State Board of Elections on the basis that, supposedly, an 1872 congressional amnesty for ex-Confederates actually applied for all time to future insurrections, including January 6th, including Madison Cawthorn. And a federal district court actually believed that and granted a preliminary injunction. We appealed that to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit, which resoundingly reversed it and said, no, the 1872 amnesty did not apply to insurrections that hadn't happened yet. But by that time, Madison Cawthorn had lost his primary. But we've still got that Fourth Circuit precedent. So if Trump tries to raise that same argument, we now have a good appellate precedent. Uh, in the case of Marjorie Taylor Greene, 
She tried to block the state process uh, in in Georgia. That was a a filing that was heard by a a Georgia judge. Uh, She ran to federal court to try and stop it. She uh, didn't succeed in stopping it in federal court. And the federal judge rejected all of her arguments. So we've got a good decision there. The state judge that heard the challenge to... Uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene's candidacy laid down some important precedent, even as he ultimately ruled against us on the facts. And the precedent that he laid down uh, is applicable to Trump. And it's about things like, what does it mean to engage in insurrection? What is the legal definition of engage? What's required? What's not required? And so his opinion uh, is actually quite useful in challenges against Trump. Uh, That New Mexico case that we talked about actually relied in part on the um, uh, Georgia opinion. And even though in the end the judge said Marjorie Taylor Greene personally, there isn't sufficient evidence that she engaged in insurrection, his decision actually laid out uh, useful uh, building blocks for us in the legal case against Trump. It seems, though, you've established that insurrection existed and the New Mexico decision convicted that gentleman on participating in the January 6th insurrection. So isn't that sufficient precedent enough? These are all valuable precedents. Uh, So I think that there are really two issues that we need to prove uh, in the in in the trials against Trump. Uh, One is that January 6th constituted an insurrection. Now, I'm going to say no serious person disputes this. I will admit that, you know, there will be some unserious people who dispute it, and it is an element of proof of our case. So we're going to need to go through it and establish it to the satisfaction of the uh, decision maker. And then the second element that we really need to prove is that Trump himself engaged in that insurrection. And of course, much of that is based on publicly available information that was known, if not that day, then you know immediately afterwards. Uh, and that's really the, the bulk of the case where the rubber meets the road. Uh, and so uh, that's what we're prepared to prove before uh, these decision-making bodies. If Trump is convicted in the Georgia case of participating in the insurrection, is that an automatic disqualification? So the interesting thing is that the criminal justice system is totally different and doesn't really intersect with Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. The criminal justice system is designed to inflict criminal punishment. Uh, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment is designed to keep people out of office. And that's not a punishment any more than uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger is being punished because he can't run for president because he wasn't born in the U.S. or that Taylor Swift is being punished. She can't run for president because she's not old enough. So in the various trials that Trump is facing, two of which do involve his actions leading up to and uh, January 6th, of course, if he is convicted, he's going to face criminal punishments. But the outcome of those criminal trials uh, doesn't actually uh, bear on this question under Section 3 one way or the other. Could Trump still take office if he was convicted? It's an interesting scenario to think of, but there is no constitutional barrier to someone who has been convicted of crimes from taking the the presidency. Uh, In fact, there's no constitutional reason why somebody who is currently incarcerated couldn't become president, although it would be extraordinarily inconvenient. So that's one of the reasons why we've been pointing to Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, because that is the provision in the Constitution that says that Donald Trump cannot hold public office. Right. Well, if I remember my history correctly, Congressman Dan Flood from Pennsylvania was in jail when he was serving in the United States Congress. I don't know that particular example, but there have been other examples of uh, officials in various levels of government who uh, you know, refused to resign and, yeah, and served part of their term in, in, in prison. And in a more dignified era, perhaps, um, something like that would have led to resignation. I think uh, in a more dignified era, perhaps uh, upon being indicted and charged in even a one criminal prosecution, Trump would have dropped out of the race. Uh, but nothing in the law required him to do so. Uh, and certainly Section 3 of the 14th Amendment is the only part of the Constitution that says that he can't return to office. Right. Well, Ron, it looks like we've just about reached the end of our program. So it's time to wrap up and get your final thoughts and your contact information so our listeners can reach out to you if they'd like to get involved in your campaign. 
Well, thank you for that opportunity, Craig. I think it's important for people to come together and realize that this is not a partisan effort. Uh, This is not about trying to help or hinder particular candidates or parties, but rather to enforce a provision of the Constitution that our our predecessors left for us uh, with a, a sign that says, in case of emergency, break glass, because they knew that anyone who had broken an oath to the Constitution and engaged in insurrection, if allowed back into power, would do it again or worse. And that's why it's so important that we enforce Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. Our website is uh www.freespeechforpeople.org. Uh, we also have a, a special site set up called trumpisdisqualified.org where people can learn more about this. And uh, we would love it if, if people would check those out. Great. Well, Ron, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure having you on our program today. Thank you for having me on. Well, here are a few of my thoughts about today's topic. I think I'm going to volunteer for Ron's effort Uh, Just as a full disclosure, I fully believe that former President Trump is disqualified from running again for his participation in the January 6th insurrection. It seems to be a self-fulfilling prophecy, but apparently there's a number of people who disagree. In any event, if you want to get involved, go to Ron's website and sign up and sign the petitions and let your local officials know that you agree. And if you disagree, don't do anything. Well, if you like what you heard today, please rate us on Apple Podcasts, your favorite podcasting app. You can also visit us at thelegaltalknetwork.com, where you can sign up for our newsletter. I'm Craig Williams. Thanks for listening. Please join us next time for another great legal topic. Remember, when you want legal, think lawyer to lawyer. Thanks for listening to Lawyer to Lawyer, produced by the broadcast professionals at Legal Talk Network. Subscribe to the RSS feed on legaltalknetwork.com or in iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer. Workers' Comp Matters is a podcast dedicated to exploring the laws, the landmark cases, and the true stories that define our workers' compensation system. I'm Judd Pierce, and together with Alan Pierce, we host a different guest each month as we bring to life this diverse area of the law. Join us on Workers' Comp Matters on the Legal Talk Network.